Hello, welcome to the Friday, November 20th, 2020 edition of the Sand Center at Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier so today walked you through a PowerShell script that drops the Formbook Trojan. Now, what's sort of interesting about this is that, yes, of course, it's obfuscated and its virus total score was a solid zero. So no antivirus engine did detect this particular PowerShell script. A couple other interesting tidbits here. First of all, uh, the code also checks if it's running in a virtual machine and uh, will refuse uh, to run the PowerShell script and actually create some DLLs that are being loaded. And uh, the DLL is obfuscated with a tool called Sephiroth Protector. A tool we kind of would like to know more about. So if you're familiar uh, with uh, this uh, tool, uh, please uh, let us know. And I've mentioned before a couple of times how Google's services are often being used for phishing and how it can be quite difficult to take down some of these phishing sites. Security company Armor Blocks now has a nice blog post highlighting some recent phishing attacks that take advantage of different Google services. Google Forms, of course, has long been used to collect uh, credentials, even though most of these form pages have a fairly obvious warning not to enter any credentials. Firebase storage has often been used to just store the basic HTML for static websites. And then of course, Google Sites has successfully been used in order to, for example, create a login pages, like an example from Armor Blocks and Office 365 login page. And yes, even Google Docs has been used uh, to store phishing PDFs and link people to the actual phishing site. Of course, the big advantage here for malicious actors is that, uh, first of all, Google is a little bit sluggish in removing these phishing sites after they are being reported. And secondly, Google is sort of considered a trusted site by many, and as a result, often not as carefully inspected by security tools as other sites. And the same security team at Salesforce that brought us the JA3 library for passive TLS fingerprinting now developed a new tool called JARM, which does active fingerprinting of TLS services in order to look for anomalies and identify malicious servers. What JARM does is it sends 10 very specific TLS client hello messages to a TLS service and then looks at the response coming back from the service. Of course, the response is depending on the particular server being used. And actually, one problem a little bit of the passive fingerprinting is that it's sometimes not that easy to fingerprint servers well because the response depends on what the TLS client hello looked like. So then similar to JA3, you can catalog these responses and essentially build fingerprint databases of malicious and non-malicious services. Doesn't of course always work. There are some malicious services that just use very standard non-malicious servers like you know, Apache or Nginx with TLS. But in some notable cases, it does appear to work quite well. For example, they looked at trick bot and Metasploit, Cobalt Strike and Async Rat and the fingerprint pulled from these tools does not match any of the fingerprints seen from Alexa's top 1 million, which should cover all the commonly used web servers. And then they went a step further and looked at uh, sites on the internet that did match, for example, the Cobalt Strike fingerprint and found some interesting domain names that do indicate some possible type of squatting, phishing and such uh, to impersonate valid domains. Okay, it's Friday again, and uh, I have with me another science.edu student, uh, Daniel Behrens. Uh, Daniel, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? 
as you said, my name is Daniel Behrens, and I'm a student uh, in the MSISE program at SANS at EDU. Uh, and uh, in my uh, regular life, I am a uh, technical marketing engineer at Cisco Systems, uh, focused on our industrial or IoT uh, security portfolio. What was great about this paper is it really gave me the opportunity to apply uh, some of the, the functionality and, and activities that I'm doing at work uh, and, and use those as part of my research paper. So that's actually great. So you were able to you know, doing work, work, and actually writing a paper about it. Now, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that paper? Yeah, absolutely. So the the paper itself is actually entitled uh, Industrial Traffic Collection, uh, Understanding the Implications of Deploying Visibility Without Impacting Production. Um, and, and realistically, uh, as we said, I was able to, to really kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. Um, in my career, a lot of times I'm, I'm working with customers and discussing some of the implications to gaining greater visibility inside industrial environments. And so uh, there, there's a lot of considerations when it comes to the, the types of assets, uh, the types of communications that are occurring, and, and really what type of impact you can have when, when trying to gain some level of visibility and, and monitoring inside these environments. Um, and so the, the real focus of the paper is just trying to help uh, organizations recognize what are their options, you know, what, what types of methodologies can they use to, to start gathering traffic flows and, and again, get a get visibility and understanding to what's occurring inside their environment. Um, and also just to, to give them an understanding of what are some of the considerations, you know, the, the, the pros and cons, if you will, um, of these different types of deployments um, and, and just things that they need to be considering when they're looking at these types of, uh, of, of connectivity and, and activities. Now, remember when we, you know, in the beginning, sort of started talking about your topic, uh, I know a little bit about uh, industrial control systems, but I'm in no ways an expert. And what really surprised me, too, sort of being a more traditional network person is some of the constraints you have there and how just you know, what we sort of consider almost passive monitoring in some remote network may actually affect uh, functionality of the device. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those uh, problems and trade-offs? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the you know the biggest piece is you know when we look at the types of devices that are employed inside industrial environments, you know in a lot of cases the the ability to even network them and, and connect them to a you know the, a common Ethernet network that we're all used to um, is in some cases a, a still a newer functionality for a lot of these devices. Um, in many cases, these things are deployed and, and run for you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty years um, before they're ever updated, before they they have the ability to be replaced. And so you know, we need to, to keep that in mind when we're looking at the, the impact of uh, augmenting or changing the, the network itself in any way, shape, or form. And so when we look at being able to actually gather all the, the, the traffic and, and gain visibility from it, um, we need to recognize that just adding the additional bandwidth or the additional overhead of, of transporting this additional traffic um, could be enough to, to impact the actual timing or, or tuning of the system. Uh, when you look at the, the communication between you know, a PLC or a programmable logic controller um, to an I.O. device, you know, we're talking sub-second, you know, sub-millisecond in some cases, communication. And so any type of added latency or jitter to the network could ultimately impact the controls and, and ultimately stop the process and, and cause issues. So it has to be basically real-time, and we're talking about real, real-time, you know, not like in normal networking where, of course, you know, we have packets being buffered, queued, and so all the time. And uh, probably sort of voice over IP has a little bit those constraints, but... I don't think uh, anything's of the sub millisecond range, or it's more sort of you know, ten to fifty milliseconds where you really get to trouble. Then, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we, you know, um, it's a bit cliche to say it, but we always, you know, always have the comments of no one. Uh, if, if someone has to wait a few seconds for their email to show up, they probably don't complain too much. Um, you know, th there's there's of course real time activity in, in enterprise networks as well, but but realistically speaking, we're we're talking about equipment that at the end of the day is interfacing with the real world, and so you know, having extremely tight control and and being able to to handle or, or communicate fast enough to to react to the environment is extremely critical. Um, and so it, it definitely brings a lot more uh, constraints and, and uh, requirements to the network. Yeah, my wife is an electrical engineer and dealt a lot with sort of control system parts, but usually on the 
sort of serial, uh, you know, networking, uh, not really networking uh, front. And she always complained about, you know, uh, once you move to Ethernet IP, well, you no longer have that dedicated pair of uh, wires that you're really sort of simulating somewhat with these packets. Now, uh, the other issue here is you mentioned that these devices hang around in the network for quite a while. Uh, so you may end up uh, with some you know, really out-of-date uh, IP stacks and TCP stacks. Uh, any issues that sort of arise uh, by you know, basically having outdated equipment that may not support some of the newer options you have? Oh, exactly right. So, you know, we, we see uh, uh, customers all the time are looking at, you know, how can we move beyond uh, the ability to just get this visibility, but even start enforcing. Um, and, and there's a great deal of, of uh, I'll call it advanced functionality that a lot of these devices don't have. Um, and so if you try and, and talk to a device uh, in a way it wasn't developed to be talked to, um, you know, a lot of these devices don't have the, the robust uh, stacks, like you mentioned, to be able to handle that scenario. Um, and so, you know, many cases we'll see environments where devices could, could fall over, so to speak, you know, they, they uh, it could be uh, essentially become expensive doorstops just because someone tried to do something like an NMAP scan, right? Um, and so that you know that's definitely one of the key considerations when it comes to getting visibilities in the environment. So, what are some of the solutions that you looked at in your paper to live with that problem? Yeah, so uh, definitely the paper was focused on the, I'll call it the fully passive type of solutions, right? So things that are, are taking in or ingesting raw traffic and and analyzing that traffic to, to gain understanding of what's taking place inside the environment. Um, the, the focus of the paper was really on the different methodologies that allow for uh, transporting, if you will, or, or getting that raw traffic to uh, whatever solution may be being leveraged to, to do the analysis. And so uh, the major focus is on uh, the, the, the three main type of, of methodologies that I looked at were uh, a, a tap type of approach. So essentially a device that you can add in line that just simply uh, replicates the traffic out at an additional port. Um, also looked at more of a local type of, of port mirroring. Um, at Cisco, we, we typically refer to it as switch port analyzer or span. Um, but essentially uh, taking the traffic as it enters the switch and just replicating it out another interface. Um, and then the last one I looked at, and realistically the, the big bigger uh, focus for the paper was in, in doing more of a, a, a remote port mirroring, or again, in Cisco, we refer to it as, as R-SPAN or re report switch port analyzer um, or remote, um, but essentially uh, a methodology to allow for the collection and duplication of that traffic and then sending it across the entire network. Um, pros and cons to each one of those, right? So obviously with a, a tap, there's the the major uh, need to add additional hardware at every single uh, connection, um, all the way up to when we get into more of the, the R-SPAN or, or re remote port mirroring scenarios, uh, just the implications of that added traffic now going across the, the same network, I'm trying to do controls. So you're basically competing with the control traffic. So the network morning traffic and control traffic Maybe have different VLANs and such, but ultimately there it's the same hardware line that you're using. Any way to sort of have your you know, sort of your classic architecture separate network management or management network, uh, so you don't compete with the control traffic, or there's some other problems that come up. Yeah, so that that is one uh, possible solution, and 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 one of the items that was discussed in the paper. Um, you know, realistically speaking, that that we see some customers going down that path, right? Actually, creating a completely out of band network just to handle uh, the, the the that span traffic or that that port mirroring traffic. Um, you know, obviously the 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 positive there is we all but eliminate any type of chance of us creating an issue, right? It, it's going across its own physical path through its own physical gear. I don't necessarily have to have such a high concern of, of devices being impacted by that. Um, but the, the major negative there is I'm, I end up more or less duplicating my network, right? And in, in, in some cases, we see uh, organizations have actually <laughs> created almost an entire secondary network just to handle the span traffic. Um, and so, you, you know, switch management, the, the actual cost of the switches, the cost of cabling, um, which frankly, cabling itself can be pretty astronomical when it comes to pricing in some of these environments. Um, you know, these are all things that, that really go into those considerations when it looks, when you look at deploying a, a solution that does this passive monitoring. 
Yeah, I imagine the cost in particular, and if you're talking about a fairly large plant or so, you're probably talking about miles and miles of wire that you have to string there. Uh, so, uh, very in the program. What's next for you? Yep. So uh, after having wrapped up this paper, and actually I just completed uh, uh, the uh, the group uh, 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 practicum, where essentially we were presented with a scenario, um, and in 24 hours I had to sit down and come up with a solution. Um, definitely a, a, an extremely interesting and fun project to work on, and and gave me a chance to interact with other people a little bit. Something that uh, in these times may be a little bit <laughs> difficult for uh, certain scenarios. Um, but right now I'm I'm actually uh, in the um, ICS 410 program, so uh, focused on the, the NERC SIP, uh, more of a utility focus. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, currently kicking off that uh, that program, and, and hopefully I'll be taking that test by the end of the year. Okay, sounds great. So uh, thanks uh, for being here and for explaining your paper to us. The link to the paper, as usual, will be in the show notes. So thanks, everyone, for listening and uh, talk to you again on Monday.